try to learn something. So we should spend some time talking about methods, I think. Uh, the reason I think we should talk about methods is I think sometimes it's, I don't think you get a lot of methods. I mean, I think you get some methods, but I think they're like other things. I think it's important to think about methods for, for the drugs, right? Because Jason, you you, you want to think about how did we how did we administer these drugs? What are they good for? How did they help when it says, hey, this reduced anxiety? What did that mean, right? And how are they measuring that objectively? If you don't think about that, then you're like, oh well, it just you gave it to people and they were less worried about school. Well, that may not have been the case. They may have given it to rats and they were less worried about falling off the edge of a table. And that's a completely different thing, and so we have to think about. So we should think about different sorts of uh, methods, right? Not a big deal. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but we'll go through sort of quickly. There are a ton of methods, right, that, uh, that we'll, we'll use, okay, uh, from a variety of disciplines. We'll talk about those as we need to. What we're really focused on here is going to be like changes in mood and behavior, right? I mean, that's, that's like the whole focus of your industry, right? Is changing people's moods and behavior, okay? You're going to, how you're going to get in there and you're going to like manipulate things, right? And I'm intentionally like picking the most nefarious words possible to describe what you do. And you're going to alter people's behavior to fit some sort of norm, right? Have you? Anybody have any doubts? That's my whole point of this is like to make you question your, your life choices and then I'll, I'll feel happy. We already do that. Yeah, but We're in the trunk. I want you to do it with some, some evidence. So we're going to think about how we're going to quantify behavioral changes. That can be difficult, right? So how many of you have seen clients? Okay. And uh, how many of you have seen some improvement in your clients? We want to see who's actually good at their job. <laughs> fewer, 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 fewer hands went up, right? Uh, well, uh, you know, how, how do you measure that, right? I mean, you obviously have some subjective sense of, well, whatever I'm doing, whether that's, you know, my efforts or efforts, you know, with some of my collaborators is making some positive improvement here, right? So you have, like, this person is getting better, but how do we measure that, right? And specifically, we want to think about, when we're thinking about drugs, we really want to make sure we can quantify that difference, right? If you're just sitting down and having a chat with someone, the side effects of that are pretty minimal, right? I mean, the worst thing that's going to happen is somebody's going to get bored and they're going to leave, right? Like, that's like, like boredom seriously is sort of the, the, the most significant side effect, right, Jason, of talking to you. Um, <laughs> but there are serious side effects when we t think about taking drugs, right? I mean, if you give someone... Uh, Lexapro, there are some serious side effects there, right? Uh, if you give someone, um, you know, even valproic acid, right? That's a, that's a little bit of a heavier drug, right? So there's some serious side effects you want to think about, right, Corey? So you want to think, well, we want to make sure we can quantify that behavioral change because we're going to be able to quantify those negative side effects. And we want to make sure that we're, we're balancing that out. So that's why it's sort of important to think about these things. Not a big deal. Uh, we will compare things to a placebo. You guys familiar with placebos? Did we talk about placebo effects in here? We did. Okay, great. In my physio class, we just had the lecture on psychopharmacology, so it's like really trying to keep in keep straight what I'm talking about. So I, I have a this is like a like a psychopharmacology sandwich because I have like physio on Tuesdays and on Thursdays, but they're like two different classes, so I do the same thing Tuesdays and Thursdays, and this class is right in the middle. All right, uh, so we are going to look at these neurochemical changes, right? That's what we're looking at with drugs. We're thinking about what are the neurochemical changes. We can measure that, but we want to measure the effect of that on behavior as well, right? So what are those drug-induced changes? One of the most difficult things, in fact, is uh, creating animal models of psychiatric disorders, right? So what, what's a what's, what do you think is the most complicated psychiatric disorder out there today? Montana, you know the answer. It's autism, 
right? And I and I, I think I say that because we have a how great of a definition do you have of depression? That's pretty solid, right? How great of a depre- definition do you have of um, anxiety? So we got that one down, right? Schizophrenia, I think we got a handle on that. Autism, it's like, well, you know, this guy does that, but this guy does something completely different, and we're going to say they both have autism, so okay, that's fine. Uh, so I think it's a very complicated, we're still working on the definition there, right? And so when you're trying to take something like autism, which we typically think of as a social disorder, right? And you're trying to uh, study that in a mouse, that gets very tricky, right? And so what you will often see is people will pull out small pieces of behavior, right? And they, they will focus on that particular aspect of it rather than trying to look at the whole constellation of symptoms, uh, which, is, which is kind of interesting, right? I mean, how would you know if a mouse had autism? Yeah, that face right there. That was that's a beautiful face. That's like I, you have no idea, right? I mean, is it going to not talk to other mice? You don't know if the mice are talking to each other, right? Is it is it stereotyped behavior? Mice do this all the time anyway. I, I mean, it doesn't. You're not going to know, right? I mean, it's just like you ever seen a mouse not do that? It's a dead mouse. That's that's it. So when we're thinking about this, it becomes very difficult sometimes, right? I mean, to really think about how we do. But we have to have those animal models because again. People are not just like donating their children uh, to people who want to give them drugs and see how their behavior changes. Right, Cassie? It's too bad. It sounds a little shady. <laughs> it's like you've got like a van or something. You're just going to drive by the park. And, yeah. I got this call today, now, in all seriousness. I don't know if any of you have kids or work in the school system. I got a call. To, I've been getting calls from the Putnam County school systems, which I'm the last person who should ever get a call from the Putnam County school systems. And I think some kid who was a genius listed my phone number instead of his mom or dad's phone number because they just started this August. I know it was, wasn't it? And so I get all these calls now. And so I got one today. Apparently, there was a social media post about some guy trying to like pick up kids at one of the Putnam County schools in his car. I don't know. I heard about it from the superintendent of the Putnam County Schools. I mean, not him personally. I mean, it was like a recording, but he called me. It's a smart trick. I mean, I know exactly what happened the first time I got the call. I knew exactly what happened. Because it's not a new phone number, right? Like, if you get a new phone number, then you think, well, maybe someone else had it. And that happened to me once. Like, I, when I lived in North Carolina, I used to get these calls. Uh, it took me a year to figure out what was going on because they were in Spanish. And so I got Spanish calls from a school. And I just uh, I had no idea what was going on. So that took a long time to get that fixed. All the same. So constantly coming up with different kinds of approaches. Animals are great, I guess, compared to people because, again, Cassie, they're not, people aren't just giving us one of their kids. And even if they were giving us one of their kids, that one kid's different than all the other kids, right? And so the DNA is going to be different. Their experiences are going to be different. Their um, sort of, uh, you know, that, that, that uterine environment is different, right, from person to person depending on what you do as an individual and what you're exposed to and what you right but with with lab animals we can control that we can control that quite a bit now the downside of that is uh Megan that creates a real problem when you try to go out and, and into uh into the real world and everybody here has um I mean within the human species we have completely different DNA if you were comparing us to like snails they would go like all oh, those folks are the same uh, you talk about like outgroup homogeneity effect uh, when snails look at people. You guys learn about that in social? That's a thing, right? Mm-hmm. Outgroup homogeneity effect? Oh, I thought you were <laughs> No, you're only going to hear about snails from me. <laughs> so I know you didn't hear that in social. So, uh, so it becomes difficult, right? But with animals, we can control their living conditions, we get their, their food, diet, everything, even their genetic background is going to be known, right? On top of that, there are some ethical issues 
with some of the, the research that we might do, right? So that's cool. And for the most part, we're going to say mammal brains are close enough to human brains, right? To, uh, you know, other mammal brains are going to be close enough, so we're going to be okay. They're going to solve a lot of the same problems, right? Rats, believe it or not, they can be depressed. That makes sense, right? They can be anxious, right? I think we can make an anxious rat. Right, Jason? I mean, what if you were just, like, screaming at your rat every time you saw it? That'd probably make it anxious, right? You could do that. How many of you have like a dog or a cat? Anybody have pets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, anybody have like an anxious dog? Yes. Yes, <laughs> who was that? Me. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's not her dog. It's, yeah, it's not mine. Sorry, she didn't live where I live, but. Um, <laughs> someone I'm not going to ask for details. <laughs> well, I'm just going to. I was going to say she's so anxious that she gets aggressive because of it, and that's hard to deal with. Yeah. They, they will give dogs Prozac. That's a, that's a normal thing. Uh, ketamine. Remember that discussion we had about ketamine? Yeah. You can get your hands on some of that. <laughs> yeah, that, that might work. I met someone this weekend who did ketamine. Really? When you meet them next week, they won't remember you. I know. That's what I After they left. After they left, yeah. Um... Anyway, so I actually have an interesting article for you about ketamine that I'm going to share later. It's like, just like after I told you that whole ketamine story, uh, there's a group at Stanford that just figured out the, why it might actually work in depression. And I didn't read the full article yet, but I kind of skimmed over it. And it seems as though instead of working on like those NMDA receptors, it also works on opioid receptors. And that's where sort of the sort of the uh, you know where it relieves the depressive symptoms is, is the action on the opioid receptors, which is sort of interesting. That ketamine has kind of that multi-receptor functionality. So and that's cutting edge. That really just came out like last week. Like I, I I told you about it Wednesday, and then like Thursday morning in my inbox was this article. Was like, wow. That's... So here's this really sad little girl, <laughs> and and she looks like. I don't know, you just like kicked her or something and took something. But anyway, I know there are a lot of folks, it's not such a big deal here. I don't see a lot of animal rights activists in West Virginia. Um, <laughs> just throwing that out there. Uh, I think the, the, the national sport is like deer kicking or something or the state sport. I don't know. Jason, are you from West Virginia? Oh. Is anybody from West Virginia? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm from this region. As well, not from West Virginia originally, but uh, I'm from very nearby. So I, I, when I say something, I'm not. I am making fun of you because I can, but <laughs> sort of in that group as well, right? Uh, so, but anyway, you don't get a lot of animal rights activists here in West Virginia. Other places you do, right? And that happens. Uh, and there are still some like moments where you have like, uh, maybe I shouldn't like you know be stabbing this animal with this giant needle and giving it ecstasy. I don't know. But then you're like, well, I'm going to learn something. So you got to kind of balance things out, right? <laughs> I used to give rats ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> I did that for a couple years. <laughs> I gave them ecstasy. I gave them cocaine. What else did we have? We had basically everything but heroin. They wouldn't let us have heroin at that time. What did you learn? Uh... What, the, one of the amazing things I learned is we took juvenile rats and we gave them like one hit of ecstasy, mm -hmm. right? And so like the, a human hit or like a rat hit? Like a rat hit. <laughs> we, we, I feel like that makes a difference. It does make a difference, and that was, a, that was actually a great question. So we scaled it for body mass, okay. right? Okay. So we gave them what would be an appropriate hit for a rat if they were to take like a recreational <laughs> hit if they were an adult, a human, right? Yeah. And so we gave them this as juveniles, and then we waited until they were adults. We just gave them like one hit, Kyle. It's like one time, right? And then we put them with like other rats as adults. And the amazing thing, Carmen, this was super cool. Uh, they were weirdos. Like they were not like, so rats are typically very social, right? And they will like nuzzle up to other rats. And they're like, they're not mice. Mice are aggressive. Those little guys are mean. Uh, but rats are really friendly. And what we found is though, uh, what was really interesting is that the, uh, the adult mice who'd been given, or the adult rats who'd been given ecstasy were actually less social. 
like like significantly less social than the uh, than just like normal control rats. Oh, that one. Yeah. Oh, no. I know. It was like pretty impressive, right? So there you go, folks. Stay off the ecstasy. <laughs> 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 I, that was a really dismissive face. I mean, it just seems counter. I know, right? Because why do you take it's ecstasy, like the sex right? Drug, and then you're yeah, in for like those, like you know, two hours, sure. Uh, <laughs> but like after that, and this was also in a developing brain, so I think that makes a big difference as well, right? I mean, if you were to, if we were to do this with adults, I don't know that the effect would have been as profound because the, the brain was not, you know, like doing its kind of organizational things and still developing. They just weren't social as adults. Yeah. So we had a grad student who watched hours and hours of video, and he would like measure how much they turned their heads to other rats. And I know, right? It sounds thrilling. Um, and so, like, if it like was more than forty-five degrees, then that counts like one point. And if it was like ninety degrees, that's two points. Like licking another rat was three points. So it was like this like point scale where you could like measure their social behaviors and quantify it. So that was pretty cool, right? Did you try it at different? We didn't. It was just like a one-time point. So. I just picture you doing this in like your frat house or something. <laughs> <laughs> You're just all sitting there in the basement. So you know some of No, no, we. Um, no, it was in a regular lab <laughs> behind like four locked doors, um, and we kept the the drugs. Obviously, we only had we had one guy that that one grad student had the key to the drug box, uh, and so the the test. This was a really great test, Jason, to see if you were allowed to have access. So there was, you could get a key to the lab, and then there was like another room that you had to get a key to, so like a second level. Then inside that room, there was a like a cabinet with a combination lock, right? And then inside that cabinet, we would keep some of the lower level drugs, some of our anesthetics and other things. And then inside of that was another lock box, and inside that lock box is where we kept like the ecstasy and the cocaine. We only had one key for that. And it was like a spike, like this long. It's like one of those like crazy four-sided keys. Uh, so one guy had that, and you'd have to call him sometimes at midnight and tell this guy like, "Hey, I need you over here because I got to give this rat some cocaine." Because when you would do this, you would like administer. Sometimes we did where we would administer like every 12 hours, right, a drug. And so you, there was no convenient. You could so you think, "Oh, why didn't you do it at six at night?" Well, that's six in the morning uh, as well, right? So there's like no good time. Right, to really make this happen. So, and he would just, and every experiment was running at different times. So you just, but to get it, the combination, there was this great security system. Uh, and our advisor, she did a background check on you, and it went like this Have you ever used drugs? <laughs> she would like <laughs> stare you in the face, and she would know because she could smell the lie coming out of you. And you, I, I mean, I was there when she asked all kinds of people, and people would say no, and she's like, Okay. Sometimes people would say no, and she would go, I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> Serious. Uh, and then sometimes, uh, you know, people just go, yeah, sure. And she's like, okay, that's fine, but you're not getting the combination. You can still work here, you know, because you weren't going to trust me. She was frightening. <laughs> she was very frightening. All right, so you got to use animals. Not a big deal. Hey, um... <laughs> So here's like a great example of why we need animal studies, right? Because most everything else is just going to be a correlation, okay? So you see a bunch of, you know, clients, whatever, right? So uh, a bunch of them were drinking while they were pregnant. Their kids are born. Their kids have uh, some developmental issues, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, right? That doesn't really prove anything to you, right? It, it's simply a correlation. We know that if you're more likely, you know, if, if you drink, you're a lot more likely to have kids that have some developmental issues, right? That doesn't really prove that relationship, doesn't really explain that relationship, right? And so that's why you have to do animal studies. And they do this all the time. Uh, they do it a lot with mice, actually. Uh, they do a lot of developmental studies with mice because they develop so rapidly, right? And so you can do a lot of studies in a short period of time. If you were trying to do a developmental study on a, a human, like let's say we want to do that ecstasy study on people. So we've got to get our hands on some 17, 18 year olds. So first we had to wait 17 to 18 years and, not ha and, and, and make sure that they didn't have any drugs prior to that point, right? Because we don't want any confounding variables. So we have to wait, say, 18 years. Then we give them some ecstasy. 
And then let's say we gotta wait another like 18 years, right? Because maybe we wanna catch them when they're adults, like 36, that's an adult number, right? Um, <laughs> and so then we gotta wait. So now we're like 36 years into this experiment and, and what do we know? Well, like nothing, right? So it doesn't really work very well with rats. On the other hand, you could do this in less than a year, two years, right? Catch them when they're, you know, six months old, give them a little ecstasy, wait six months and see what happens. It's a done deal. Uh, animal testing, strict guidelines. There are a ton of strict guidelines. There are probably three to eight different outside entities that can show up randomly in your lab and ask you what you're doing and shut you down and or put you in jail. When I was in graduate school, we had the DEA show up once. Before we did. So, for those of you, I guess Montana, you're the only one who took my physio class, right? You know my story about Descartes and not waking up early, right? Because it will kill you. And that's a pretty true story of most people in science. Quite often, the, depending on what you're doing, you want to work later at night when there are fewer people in the building. So they're not, uh, you know, going up and down the elevator and shaking things, which makes a big difference. Electrical signals, if you're recording from brains, right? This is all important stuff. So quite often, you'll work late at night and, and you'll come in late the next day. So I don't think anybody was in my lab before 10 a.m. Um, in graduate school, right? It just wasn't going to happen. Uh, the technician might come in and prep stuff for us, but they would come in. We come in one day and there's a guy waiting outside the lab and he's got a DEA badge. <laughs> He'd been there a little while. I guess the DEA starts early. <laughs> uh, so he had to make sure because we were using like pentobarbital as an anesthetic and we had ketamine as well that we used as an anesthetic. And, um, and so they came in and had to like measure how much we had, look at all of our drug logs. It was like serious business. I'd been shuttling ketamine back and forth on the bus between we had a <laughs> yeah, we had a we had a main like similar to here we had a main campus and like a med school campus right and so I would just ride the city bus and or ride my bicycle like through through the city right so um, and I would take drugs I would take brains and jars whatever I needed to get from one campus to the other because I would you know if we were doing different experiments because I worked in sort of two different labs. Apparently that's a no-no with the DEA, uh, and but thankfully they let us pass because we'd accounted for everything with all of our logs. Uh, but every time it could have been like a ten thousand uh, dollar, yeah, and like like ten years in jail. So it could have been bad. It really stalled my career, Jason. <laughs> I don't know which would have been worse, like having to go to jail or having to pay back all that money because it would have been bad. Um, there's some actual like legislation that says here's how you have to take care of animals, right, in research labs, which is really sort of frustrating because there's not a whole lot of uh, legislation that says this is how you have to take care of your kids or this is how you have to take care of your own pets, right? Uh, and I know people get worked up all the time. Like, I, I don't know, I saw this ad once in the Lexington paper in the Herald Leader. It was like, watch out for scientists coming to steal your dogs. <laughs> Seriously, they put that in the classified section, like this little thing in there, and I was like, these guys are idiots. Because, one, I mean, if you, do you remember that Destiny, that whole time I told you, like, wow, we really wanted to control genetics and diet and childhood, ex you know, like life, early life experience, all that stuff with these laboratory animals? If I just, like, randomly pluck your dog off the street, eh, I'm not doing that, right? Seems like a bad idea. It's not scientific. So you're never going to catch someone. Like, there's not going to be a guy running around in a lab coat going, boy, I need that beagle. <laughs> Actually, they used to use a lot of beagles for research when I was in grad school. Um, relax, they gave them away uh, at the end. But there was like this huge, long waiting it's list. Such a random breed. Like, oh, sorry. The reason they use beagles is uh, they get uh, like an analog of HPV on their, um, like on their lips, but it just like goes away. So they can they, they get like these little flare-ups and things go away. So they were working on developing like the H was it Gardasil or whatever. They were working on developing that and, and extensions of that. And so they were using beagles to. Um, so so there you go, right? So they just like cut these warts off the beagle lips, which I guess was nice for the beagles, right? Because they got the warts removed. Um, and then at the end, they would give the beagles away to people. But there was like a huge waiting list, so I never got a beagle. Because uh, everybody wanted a beagle puppy, right? I mean, who doesn't want a beagle puppy? Like, if I had a beagle puppy up here, who would take it? Everyone, right? I mean, it's just, that's the way it works. So there you go.
No? Someone said no? Hey. Maybe beetles are nice. I don't know. I don't know. You're not a, but you could, like, set it on top of that other dog and maybe hold it still. No. That wouldn't last very long. No. Yeah. All right. Kathy, you need a corrective experience. Uh, <laughs> maybe in, like, you know, six or seven years, that will happen. Yeah. Trump will be very, very interesting. Uh, true, yeah. All right, so all kinds of other protocol stuff, uh, um, stuff you don't really worry about. All right, animal tests, you guys know about face validity, right? Somebody yelled that at you once or twice, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know who teaches classes about face validity, but I'm assuming there's a lot of yelling in that class. Um, is that true? No, there's no yelling. Uh, so face validity, right? So it's got to closely resemble stuff on humans, whatever. Uh, not a big deal. The problem is, again, when you get to things like guilt, delusions, altered mood, how are you going to quantify that with animal behavior, right? So that's got lower face weight. That's harder to figure out, right? Let's do it. We'll do some things. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about predictive validity. Anything that we um, do in the lab, we really want to try to predict whatever the clinical effect is, right? So you want to be able, if, if we we give a dog Prozac, we want that to be able to predict what happens when we give a human Prozac, right? And the effects are largely the same. Uh, construct validity, I'm not going to, you know, hit you a whole lot on these kinds of different types of validity, but, uh, but we really need to actually measure what we're trying to measure, right? So really we want all of these things. And we also want this nice dose response curve when we, when we do uh, tests. High reliability, right? You guys know we want to get the same results over and over again, right? If you don't get the same results, then you're probably doing something wrong or a lot of something's wrong. Right? All right, so let's think about some behavioral tests that we might do. Some things are going to be very simple, right? Uh, let's say we're testing out an anti-epileptic, okay? Well, then we should be able to give that uh, to an animal and they should have less seizures, right? I mean, that fewer seizures. That's pretty straightforward, right? And that's kind of an easy thing to measure. Uh, for looking at other sort of uh, effects, we should be able to measure that, right? For, you know, we can measure sleep, sedation, loss of coordination, things for motor activity. These are very straightforward, easy tests or behavioral tests. Same things will happen to people typically if you give it to them. Uh, what about operant conditioning? You guys familiar with that? I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. We're going to do uh, schedules of reinforcement. You guys know about fixed ratio stuff, fixed interval stuff. You don't have to spend too long on that, right? Kind of depends on you're going to use whatever sort of uh, schedule of reinforcement works for your particular uh, study, right? If you were actually going to design studies, Destiny, then you might need to spend a little more time on this, right? But keep in mind, uh, sometimes it's important to think about, uh, you know, what kind of schedule of reinforcement did they use because that can change your effects, right? and that will have an effect on the behavior of the animal. Hey, there's a box with a rat in it. Uh, that's fun. Uh, this is just a simple operant chamber. Some people call these Skinner boxes. Um, you know, whatever. It's got a lever, it presses a lever, it gets a treat. Those, that's a really small one, actually. I mean, it's not. A, they're all about that same size, but this is an automated one. Lights come on. Whatever, you can make it do all kinds of things, right? Uh, what if we wanted to measure, uh, like, pain? So if I was going to test pain for you, right, so, all right, here's a great thing. Uh, let's say you're experiencing a lot of pain. I'm going to give you a medication, and then I just ask, like, hey, how's your pain? And you can go, well, it's less, right, and you can measure that. Uh, the problem with a rat, you can't really do that. If you ask a rat, like, hey, how much pain are you in, it's just going to look at you and, that's what they always do. Uh, so there's the tail flick test. Uh, they'll typically apply heat to the tail of the rat, and then when it moves its tail, then you know like it was too hot, right? There's no really other. There's no other way to do it. Can you think of another way? No, there's not. Because somebody spent a lot of time on this. If the pain, the stronger the pain reliever, the longer it will leave its tail there, right? Because the less it feels pain. If the pain reliever doesn't work very well, it'll just move its tail quickly away. Um, if it's uh, 
you know, pretty strong. Let's say we gave this guy some, uh, I don't know, I'm giving him some Oxycontin, for example. That's a pretty good pain reliever. Uh, I mean, his tail could just be there for days, you know, compared to not having any pain reliever at all. So there's your, uh, there's your uh, tail flick test. That's a fun one, right? Uh, they also use a hot plate. That happens too. Um, kind of see how much the rat moves around or how distressed it looks. You're not going to put it directly on the hot plate. <laughs> you're going to, you're going <laughs> to, yeah, there's going to be some space. Like it's going to be in this other sort of, uh, you know, like cylinder up above that, right? So it'll like move around. Yeah. It's just a do yeah, it's a double boiler. There you go. So you could do this at home. Without all of the FDA and the USDA and the DEA involved, right? You don't have to worry about that stuff. Not a big deal. We're not going to worry about that too much. Oh, foot shock, that's a thing. Uh, they use that a lot for animals as well, for animal studies. You can turn off the foot shock, you can like, train the animal to do that. Um, if you were testing uh, like an analgesic, you could, uh, you know, just like a small shock, they may not feel that, so then they're not going to try to turn that off, right? Uh, what about, so let's move away from like inflicting pain and let's do like learning and memory kinds of things, right? So you're not, I mean, you're going to be dealing with individuals who are taking pain relievers, right? That's the thing. Uh, I would say most of the folks, if you see someone who's got a problem with pain relievers, it's going to be a dependency issue, right? So you have to deal with that. Uh, but learning and memory, that's an important, uh, important issue here. Quite often what they will do to test learning and memory in animals we will show them something or do some sort of training. We'll wait, a, we'll wait a while, and then we'll make them do that task again and see how great they are at that, right? And I think that's a pretty similar approach to humans, right? If you want to know how smart someone is, I tell you something now, and then 12 weeks later I ask you about it. And then I, I hope you tell me, it, right? That, that's like a final exam. I'm just kind of like referencing that, putting it in terms for you guys, right? So there you go. Uh, there are a lot of mazes that are used for this. There's the T maze. That one's really complicated. It's shaped like a T. Right? So you put the rat in one end, the, the long part of the T. Uh, it runs down to the end. On one side, let's imagine, is what's the thing rats like? Another rat. Uh, food. Right? Something like that. On the other arm, you could put nothing. Or you could put something that a rat doesn't like. Like a cat. Or a uh, cat urine, for example. Uh, rats don't like cat urine. They'll run away from that. So that's a good way to keep rats away from your house, to spray it with urine, cat urine. Mm -hmm. Nobody thinks about that, right? Jason, that's a, that's a marketable sort of issue, right? I went to the Columbus Zoo recently, uh, like a few months ago, and so I was like driving, you know, you drive, in, and there's like Frank's deer urine, right? You've driven by Frank's deer urine. And I think like, how does he catch that? <laughs> I mean, I know where he gets it because I, you know, I know where deer urine is made. It's made in a deer bladder. But I'm thinking, <laughs> like, did he train the deer to just like into a bucket, or is he out there like trying to free catch it with like a ladle or something? <laughs> <laughs> Ask your vet how they catch your cat's urine. That's how they do it. I just didn't think about that. Did out of the cat bladder, they gotta try to catch it when it pees. Oh. I know, right? How do you get human it's exactly how you get human urine. It's the free catch method. Only you're catching your own. The cat's not in there with a cup. <laughs> Olivia, most people don't think about how weird that is. And then you walk back with this like <laughs> sloshing around with this cup of urine and you're thinking like isn't there a better way to see if I have diabetes yeah I don't know so there you go uh, some drugs uh, believe it or not hey what's a drug that might affect your memory yeah, there you go <laughs> I almost said and who's on it um, <laughs> nobody was coming up with that answer uh, yeah ketamine's one that can affect your head memory. Thanks for that, Kyle. Right on top of it. 
Hey, the problem with this, though, is um, not only can it affect your memory, but it also might make you less hungry. And that's bad. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's bad in general because you're like, well, you know, you don't want to be too much less hungry because then you die, right? Like, if you're never hungry, then that becomes a problem. Uh, but the real problem with these studies is if you become less hungry and you're a rat, and I'm using food as a reward to get you to perform a certain behavior, then you're not going to perform that behavior, right? And then, Montana, do I know if that was because the animal wasn't hungry, or was it because the animal forgot where it was? And I don't really know, right? And so we have to really think about those effects, and there are ways you can kind of work around that. This is why, quite often, if you read studies, they will... Um, sort of restrict food intake for animals when they're when they're in these types of studies. They'll even sometimes uh, reduce their body weight down to like 75% of their free feeding weight. So you kind of just let a rat eat however much it wants, figure out how much it weighs, and then restrict its diet until it weighs 75% of that amount. So there you go, right? So I mean, if you think about like, how many of you do you, th or you think you're at like your free feeding weight, right? I mean, it's... <laughs> I'm just like thinking about it, right? I mean, like I would say most people are, probably, you know, probably at your free feeding weight. Uh, and then if you reduce your weight by like 25%, I mean, that would motivate you to do some things, right? I, I mean, it would motivate you to perform behaviors that someone said would get you food, right? And so that's that's what we do with animals. Uh, what about the uh, so T mazes? Oh, there's the radial arm maze. That's actually a little bit bigger. It's kind of like a tea maze, but it's got like eight arms instead. And so you put the rat down in the middle, Sierra, and then it's, it just doesn't know which way to go. Instead of just having two, two choices. So, all right, I'm thinking of a number between one and two, and it's a whole number, Cassie. I want you to guess it. Two. Okay, it was two, right? But you had a 50% chance of getting that, right? Okay, so even if you like, have totally forgotten everything, 50% of the time, you're going to get that correct, right? So it's like, oh, but well, what if I gave you, what if I said I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 8? Well, now your likelihood of guessing correctly by chance is drastically reduced, right? So the more options we give the animal, the more sensitive we are in a, uh, being able to determine is it really forgetting or not forgetting. So that's why you might do the radial arm. Um, so there's like a radial arm test, right? Put it in the middle and it'll go out one of these arms. I think this one only has, no, this one has eight arms. <coughs> uh, hey, what about the war Morris water maze? <clears throat> Who likes to watch rats swim? <clears throat> you all right, Destiny? I, sh <laughs> I should tell you. Um, so we, you know, we, not this year, but the year before, we hired two new faculty members in this department, right? And so we interviewed a number of people for that. I don't know if you were fortunate or unfortunate enough to meet those folks. Um, but we brought in a candidate. And we actually didn't end up hiring this candidate. Uh, but she came in, and she was getting ready to give her a talk in front of students. They said, and she was staying at that, uh, you know that hotel that's like up at the top of the hill from Bob Evans? It's like a Fairfield Inn or something. So first of all, I went to the wrong hotel because somebody told me she was staying at the Marriott. There is not a Marriott in Huntington, West Virginia. There's like a town place by Marriott, and a, I think it's like a Fairfield Inn by Marriott, right? So, of course, I go to the first Marriott, or something by Marriott, so, well, whatever. Uh, and I'm sitting down there for like 15 minutes waiting on her, and I'm frustrated because she's not showing up, right? I think, what kind of impression does this make? And then I realized that I was at the wrong hotel. So I had to go up the hill and pick her up. But anyway, uh, so she's getting ready to give her a talk in front of like this whole group of students and she's drinking some water and I'm talking about they just like filling in some time and I mentioned that giant fiberglass elephant that's <laughs> that's up there for for no reason which I, I have since learned is actually uh, like a pediatric dentist office right and so it still doesn't make any sense but at least I know what's there and then she just spewed water like she was, she was like getting this and then just <laughs> which was like the greatest moment ever in an interview. So, I know some of you are gonna have to have like job interviews sometime, right? Just as a heads up, don't like spew water in the middle of an interview. That's not why we didn't hire her. But I thought I'd share that story anyway. 
So the Morris water maze, this is interesting. Uh, you will put the mouse in water, like a kid. So it's really advanced because it's like a kiddie pool. So basically, you get a kiddie pool and you put some water in it. Now the trick is you actually have to make the water opaque. Uh, in some places, that's not as difficult as others, uh, depending on what comes out of your tap. But you, <laughs> you would add some uh, dye. Some people will put milk in there. Um, which is, I know that, that's the face I made too, right? I'm just going to put dye in there. Uh, and the animals have to swim around until they find this hidden platform. Often they will put landmarks, like spatial. That's why there's like a checkerboard here and this school crossing sign or whatever. I don't know. The rat can see those and it will know, like, hey, over by the red checkerboard, that's where I can get out of the water. And so it'll have that platform where it doesn't have to swim. Now, if you start messing around with the rats, you know, give them different drugs, it can affect their memory. That's a problem. Um, you can actually remove parts of their brain and they won't know where they're going either. Their hippocampus. Hey, this is important. There's a big video camera up here. I don't know what kind of drawing that is. It's like the worst drawing of a video camera ever. But you're going to have to watch that from the top and then like measure how long it takes the rat to find the platform on or off the drug and then see if there are any problems with memory. Because you probably, well, I don't know, I guess if you're giving people ketamine for depression, you want them to have memory problems. Most of the time, you're not wanting folks to have memory problems when you're giving them some sort of drug, right? So if you give a drug to a rat, and it's like, well, that rat seems happy, but it doesn't even remember where its food dish is, that's probably a, not a drug you want to pass on up to people. Uh, hey, what about the delayed response test, right? Very similar to some of the working memory tests that you might take. If you're trying to give those tests, anybody ever given like working memory tests to, to people, right? Corey, you seem to have done that. Okay, so the basic idea is this: you first, you always put the kid in a cage, uh, <laughs> safe place for them. Uh, so, so in this case, we've got a monkey. You go like, hey, here's some food. There's an empty dish. You put a lid on it, close it down so the monkey can't see it for a while. You can, you know, delay this time, whatever, uh, whatever time frame you want. You raise that up, and the monkey goes, okay. It's in this bin, it's not in that bin, whatever. So that's kind of your basic learning and memory test. What about anxiety? Um, <clears throat> so for human anxiety, you know, that's pretty easy. You can just ask somebody how anxious they are. With animals, we've got to look at their behavior closely to see what's happening, right? One of the often one is uh, one that's often used is what we call a light dark crossing task. Okay. So what you will do is you'll have one side will be uh, sort of well lit and the other side will be darker, and you'll see how many times the animal crosses back and forth, how much time they spend in one area versus another. Right. Lots of animals will prefer to stay in the dark part, right, so they can stay hidden from you. <coughs> that makes some sense, right? Uh, so they may not go over to the light part as often. Um, so, is this the method that they were using in the crayfish? Yeah, experiment? yeah. So there's some folks. I don't know if you guys like crayfish or not. Um, they're typically good on catfish. If you, Jason, you have this weird look on your face. <laughs> really, you're missing out. So they have over in the the science building. There's some guys who are doing some work with these crayfish. Uh, they actually jack up the manganese levels in the water, right? Which is sort of an environmental toxin. Um, interestingly, an environmental toxin here, right? Uh, so, so there are kind of elevated manganese levels in some water supplies uh, around here. So they'll jack up the manganese levels. And then they'll put these um, crayfish, they actually use like a, like a, uh, a tea maze. And you know, they always have, it's basically PVC pipe and they flood it with a little bit of water. And the crayfish will swim down. One side's gonna be light and one side's gonna be dark. How many of you have ever like, you know, tried to hunt for crayfish like when you were a kid or like last week. Um, and so you like, you, you, they're under rocks typically and you pull up the rock and then they jet away, right? They like to stay in the dark and they like to hide. So the idea is that if a normal crayfish will go down and it'll see like the light part, it's like, nah, forget that, and it'll go over to the dark side, right? And they'll kind of hide over there. Uh, these crayfish that they've got, that have the elevated manganese levels, they actually seem to spend a lot of time, more than they should, over in the really bright side. Which is not a, a bright idea, no pun intended. Uh, because what happens when you go over there, you're, 
you know, it's easy for somebody to eat you, right, and to grab you. So that's not a good idea. So they're actually working. This is kind of the cool part they're doing there. They're actually looking at like serotonin levels to see if it's um, if they're dealing with like a poor decision making model or a risk taking model, right? So so how is this? Like what what kind of cognitive effect is that really, right? Is it is it because they're just like really brave, like uh, crayfish, and they're like watch out, I'll fight off this bird, or is it because that they really are just making? You might think that's a bad choice, but that's like a risk they're going to take. Uh, but you might they might just be making bad choices. They're like, well, I'll just go over here because for whatever reason. And then I just start to wonder, like, how many of you are making bad decisions because there's too much manganese in your water? How many of you filter the water you drink? How many of you filter it twice? <laughs> you buy bottled? Yeah, I don't drink. You have to, though. I mean, yeah. the alternative is to not shower. Yeah. I think. Yeah. You, you want me to tell you what part of the problem is? It's where it's um, the water is privatized. Here in West Virginia, you guys know that, right? Because you have West Virginia American water. Are you guys familiar with this? Like, like a lot of places have municipal water, where like the city government, well, not that I would trust the city government, but some city governments I would trust with my water more than I would like a private company who's just trying to make money off you, right? Mm -hmm. you, see, you see the difference there? That's why there's like a problem with like privatizing prisons, right? When you take that out of the hands of the government and people can make money on something, um, they'll, they will. And they will do that by cutting corners, right? And so when you privatize utilities like, um, or like, uh, water shouldn't even really be a utility, it should be kind of a human right to have clean water, right? But when you privatize that, it really um, brings in the possibility of corruption and, and problems. So, and I think if you were to sort of follow the water story here over some time, you would see that that's, that's a fairly accurate depiction. So there you go. They also charge you too much for water here. Do you know that? Because I lived in North Carolina before I moved here. I lived in like a real city. Uh, I lived in Winston-Salem. Not that it's a massive city, but it was an actual city, right? It was like a, this isn't, right? So Huntington, West Virginia, I don't think is like a real city. It's a place that has some buildings and streets. Um, I mean, it's just not at that threshold of size, right? I mean, it's not. Even if it was at capacity, which it's, it's underpopulated, right, for the infrastructure that's here. So even if it was at capacity of like 70 to 80,000, right, which is about what this would be, um, it's still not, right, it's still not quite there. Uh, I paid like a third as much for my water because it was municipal water. West Virginia, so here's this, like, I just really hate West Virginia American water. I'm just going to tell you one more thing. They don't give you enough water. Like, so, like, if you, you guys pay attention to your water bill, you should. They only give you 1,500 gallons, right, for, like, your standard use. Most places will give you 4,500 gallons, right? And then they start charging you per gallon. West Virginia, see? So, so like, you'll pay, like, 30 bucks for 4,500 gallons, and then you pay per gallon. West Virginia American water, you pay, like, $35 for 1,500 gallons, and then you start paying more. The United States government estimates that a, like an average person uses about three to 4,000 gallons of water a month, right? So they don't even give you as much water as what the government says you should be using before they start charging you like per gallon. How about that? Uh, the yes, all of them. So there you go, that's the problem with privatized water. That doesn't really have a whole lot to do with this, but. <laughs> But we'll bring it right back to that manganese story and that awesome tea maze and the light dark crossing. Right? So it's like a big circle. Sorry about that rant. <laughs> Any of you not live in West Virginia? Ohio? No, I'm from Pennsylvania. But you lived here now. So. Yeah, but I live here, but I hate it here. <laughs> and you're not making me like it anymore with that discussion. You're welcome. Thanks for the cheaper Yeah, I know. The electric is a little high too. Yeah. Yeah. Goats of breeding age. You got any of those? They send me that paper every year, and I have to write down how many goats I own of breeding age. 
Don't ask. I don't have any, in case you need one. Uh, other things we might do for anxiety is the open field test, right? So basically we put a rat in a big box and we see how much it moves around. Rats will, or rodents, will typically stay near the walls, okay? Because that's safe, right? That's standard behavior. If we give it an anti-anxiety drug, guess where it'll go? It'll go more toward the middle, right? Because it's like less anxious. So it's like, all right, I'll just see what's out here in the middle. So I think about it like kids learning to roller skate, right? So I don't know if you've ever been roller skating. Maybe your grandparents did. That was a thing they used to do. Um, anybody watching Sharp Objects? I'm only halfway through that show, so don't tell me how it ends. So I'm, I'm in episode, I just watched episode four last night. I've got no idea what's going on, Jason. How far did, did you watch the whole thing? Um, I still watched two episodes. I, I just watched the one where they have the, like, Zephram Cochran days or whatever it is. That's not what it's called. Whatever it is. It's like the, the like, Civil War Festival or whatever <laughs> at that lady's house. They're always on roller skates. What's that about? You still, you still don't know, and you're like two episodes ahead of me, so, I, so I'm never going to know. It's a weird show. It's Amy Adams. I mean, the acting's great. The writing's pretty good. I got no idea what's going on. These little kids keep dying. That's all I know. And there's a pig's head. Open field. We give you that. You're going to be more exploratory, right? You're going to go out. Think about... Um, I don't know, instead of like kids roller skating, think about kids at a dance, right? Like middle school dance, I think about all these kids with these anxieties that are over near the walls, and then you give them these drugs, and they like go out in the middle and dance around, they're less anxious. That may not be a good thing. <laughs> uh, oh, hey, this is something, the elevated plus maze. So, you know, just when you thought a maze was awesome, let's put it off the ground a little bit, because they can fall. And... <laughs> Two of the arms are going to be like enclosed, so rats would typically want to stay in there because that's safe. And then two of the arms are just going to be like planks, just like open planks, right? So they can just like walk out on those and like fall off the edge. Um, again, if you give a rat an anti-anxiety drug, they'll spend more time out here exploring on this ledge than they would in either of these sort of safety arms. So there you go. Now, is that fairly analogous to a, uh, a person with anxiety? What about a person who's agoraphobic, right? And guess where they would want to be? Inside their house all the time. Guess where they don't want to be? Like out on the sidewalk, right? So it's, it's a pretty nice analog, I think, right? You kind of have that nice, nice match there. Uh, zero maze, don't worry about that. It's just like a fancy one. It's like a, it's like a donut. Hey, what about social interactions, right? We talked about social interactions a little bit. There's like the one chamber test where you can put a bunch of rats in one chamber uh, and see if they interact with each other. It's not a big deal, we talked about that. There are also other chambers, and these are sort of fancy, where you might wanna see if they remember another animal that they've seen before, how much do they prefer, you know, one animal versus another. If you wanted to get some advanced sort of uh, social interactions, you could do that. Not a big deal. So this is the basic idea. You could put a rat sort of in one of these, and then you have like a, you know, uh, or in this case they're using mice. You have a mouse in either of these, and you can go over and like the mouse can sniff, but they can't actually get inside. Just kind of measure what the mouse does. Don't worry about this too much. Again, this is just another way to measure anxiety, ultrasonic vocalizations. Uh, I don't know what's going upstairs. Like the, the log rolling team must practice up there. <laughs> don't worry. Uh, oh, uh, there's like water licks. Uh, this is something. Hey, who loves getting a drink out of the water fountain? What if like every 20 times you did, you got shocked? <laughs> Sounds like fun, right? That's what we should do. Uh, and then we can put up a little camera. See, Jason, I'm planning this great experiment. We're gonna we're gonna put a little shocker in the uh, in the water fountain. See what happens. We have to probably put a sign up like, "Don't use this if you have a pacemaker." <laughs> That'd be like a weird sign for a or or what? Well, you may 
pregnant. You shouldn't be drinking the water here if you should be if you might be pregnant anyway. <laughs> that, that should be. Remember that conversation we had about West Virginia American water. Mm -hmm. Is it like actually safe to drink the water here? I mean, I don't, but like, <laughs> so, I've lived at other places besides here. I've never lived somewhere where they had strict limits on whether or not I could eat the fish out of all of the streams and waterways in an entire state until I moved here. That's troubling, right? Now there are some places where it's like, you probably shouldn't eat out of this one, but these guys over here are okay to catch and eat, right? But they have like limits. There are some of the, like a lot of them here, like never eat out of them, right? Like fish that you catch. Some of them it's like maybe once every six months you could have like a fillet out of this, out of this river. But most of them, it's what? Who will pay me? Really? Yeah. That worked out for you. Really? Yeah. You never sue them. <laughs> Is that true? Yes. You can't sue them either? I, I don't know. I'm a child. I don't know what I signed. <laughs> that seems shady. Yeah, it was in a trailer. What? <laughs> Wait. You remember that call I got from the Putnam County Schools? <laughs> That's weird. your kids in that water. Yeah. Wow. People baptize their kids. I sort of made that up. Yeah. Like that I saw it on TV once. People dunk each other in the river. Sometimes. Yeah, by your house that little creek was but I think they do that there. There's, There's like dunk people in there. That's a real test of faith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just telling you. you Got to be the pope to jump in there. <laughs> Sorry, I, I mean, if anybody is the Pope, I didn't mean that to offend you. <laughs> side story. All right, so we can give rest a shock. What's interesting is you can look at the, like, you know, like their urge to drink because they're thirsty and, like, how bad they don't want to get shocked, right? You can see that causing me some anxiety. Like, so, Jason, we're going to do this over at that water fountain. And, like, people are going to come up like, man, it's like, especially now. Because it's about 400 degrees Celsius outside, um, and people are going to go. I really want some water, but oh man, that's going to shock me. It's going to happen. I don't know. Uh, hey, what about conditioned emotional responses? This is something, right? Here's another way to like measure fear. Uh, this is a way if you wanted to test drugs for um, like PTSD or something, right? You could use this particular paradigm. Uh, we would flash a light or make a noise, and then shock. An animal that sounds like fun, and then you just keep doing that, right? Like light shock, light shock, light shock, and then guess what? You just like flash the light, and all of a sudden the animal goes, "Oh man, I'm scared," because I think the shock's coming, right? So that's something. What about depressive behavior? Notice we use this phrase, phrase "depressive like behavior," right? I don't think that, what, what DSM are you guys on now? Seven, twelve, six and a half, text revision of the first, I, what, what is it? I don't know. Five. Oh, five. So you guys have DSM five, right? Um, how much statistics are in that book? Are there a lot? Because it says diagnostic and statistical manual. That's there what the... Are, that's what the S is, right? Yeah. It says like 20% of the population has dissociative identity disorder or some shit. That's not right. Yeah, that seems weird. Okay. Well, that's not real. Because that means like, <laughs> no, it's just like that's like three of you have that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yeah, so someone said yes, like in, in the affirmative. Like, yes, I know the three people in this class who have that. Uh, not, not yes, that doesn't make sense. I don't, I don't know. Um, that's why it was the second one? No, it was the first one. It was the first one. That's what I thought, Megan. You can give me their names after class. Just write them down, pass a note. Um, I mean, I'll figure it out soon enough. So, depressive like behavior, because the DSM-5 does not have criteria for diagnosing a rat. It barely has criteria for diagnosing a human. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there you go, right? That's what I think about it. It's great if you're a little short and you need a boost in your seat to make you look taller. That's how I would use the DSM-5. Or the 4, or the 3, or the TR, whichever one that went to. There wasn't a 1, was there? They called DSM-1 or just DSM when that came out? Anybody? You, you guys weren't alive probably then, were you? I don't even know when that was. It was a very long time. 1800s. 1800s. <laughs> uh, there you go. I can just see it like William James and... Um, now the guy's name left me, but he wanted to be a magician. Mm. What's his like name? Dalton? In here. I don't know. That's what that is. Anyway, uh, we'll give drugs to animals to see if it alleviates their depressive like symptoms, right? Uh, again, this is a pretty complex disorder. This is, this is actually more difficult than anxiety, right? Anxiety is easy to measure in a rat. How much does that rat hug the wall? That's normal. You give it an anti-anxiety drug, it doesn't hug the wall. We can quantify that. We can quantify, Carmen, how much time it spins away from the wall, how far it gets away from the wall, right? It's overall locomotive behavior, right? We can measure all of that. But some of these other things are a little different. Um, so here's, so let's skip down to here. Uh, we're assuming that immobility reflects lowered mood, right? And that's pretty standard. Like, so Olivia, if you were going to diagnose depression and this was someone who was like up constantly moving around, doing things, like, boy, I feel really depressed all the time when I'm out, like picking up trash and volunteering here and uh, running marathons and, uh, you know, when I, when I go and feed the homeless and then I get, I'm, I'm also depressed at home when I'm, you know, like washing my windows. It doesn't really sound like someone who's depressed, does it? I mean, that sounds like someone who's up and doing things and well, if that's what you think is depressed, well, that's fine. We'll just let you go, and I've got other clients I need to see. But if you talk... It just has to be psychomotor retardation. I understand that. But with a rat, it does. <laughs> right? Because a rat's not going to tell me how it feels. Okay? So with a rat, it does have to be, right? It does have to be that immobility. Okay? Because that's what we're going to look at. That's the assumption we're making. Right? With rats. And so there are a couple things you might do. One of those is the tail suspension test. So this is fun. Um, you uh, let the rat wrap its tail around, right, uh, something, and then you see like how long, um, how long it'll hang there. Struggles. Yeah. And if they're depressed, they'll do this, right? Like how long do depressed people struggle with problems? They don't. And so that's what we're looking for in the rat. That should be in the DSM-5. I'll put that in the 6. Pictures only. Depression. Just faces like that. Think that would be popular, Jason? It would make it easier for some people to diagnose. I think so, right? Yeah. Uh, there's also the like forced swim test. That's when you make a rat swim. <laughs> I know, right? It was, it was really, they come up with these fancy names, like this is the uh, elevated T maze. It's like you put a T maze on a table, you know, <laughs> whatever. This, huh? Sponsored by Merck. Sponsored by Ah, jeez, yeah. So anyway, this rat is gonna swim in here. If it's a depressed rat, it'll just kind of right <laughs> down to the bottom and just sit there and wait on you to get it out. True story. If you give it an antidepressant, it'll swim longer. Because it's like, I actually have hope for my future, and I'm going to get out of here. And not, please, world end. Right? This is why, this is why I didn't become a clinician. 
That and I didn't really want to help people. Uh, what about learned helplessness? That's something. Uh, there's like these foot shocks. We're just going to give them a foot shock all the time, right? Just sort of randomly. Not a big deal. Um, here's another thing that they might do, uh, like chronic mild unpredictable stress. So you'll do things to them. You'll just like kind of make things cold sometimes. Spray them down with water. That's stressful. Squeeze them. Uh, you restrain them, right? Rats don't like being like restrained. Squeeze them. Like an Elmira sort of. Anybody watch Tiny Toons? Was that a reference? No one. Was that lost on everybody? Elmira? Mm -hmm. She was like the crazy kid with the skull for a hair bow and would just like squeeze animals all the time. Mm -hmm. You don't remember that one? I've never watched that. There you go. <laughs> anyway, you can do this. Um, and they're actually going to have behaviors that are very similar to depressed individuals. Social defeat, that's another one. This is when you have a rat, and it's like, hey, man, this is like my cool rat house. Uh, and then you just bring in like a bigger, badder rat to beat it up. Um, and that's going to make the rat feel bad. The first rat, the second rat will feel awesome. So you can do two studies at once there. You do what happens to this rat that feels bad, but what about the one that feels good, right? You can study things there. That's interesting. Uh, again, these rats are going to act like they're depressed individuals. So you can you can give these rats antidepressants before, during, after, and kind of measure their change in behavior. Hey, what about maternal separation when all else fails? Like rip the pups away from the mother. That'll cause some, some stress and, and um, actually causes a lot of abnormalities. Right? Do you guys ever see people that have been ripped away from their parents? No? You have to, right? I mean, that's like... I don't know what you all do. Uh, but this can actually cause a lot of problems. What's really interesting is it's behavioral, but again, we always want to connect behavioral back to something biological, right? And I think that's what's fascinating about these things. Uh, and again... How many pages long was that article you were supposed to read? The one by Oheb? <laughs> I couldn't find it. I couldn't Looked find it. Looked for a while. You could not find it. I found it. How did Cassie find it? I don't know. I, don't know. I, I checked it. I checked it. I found a different one. It was like 367 pages, and then I said, fuck that. <laughs> it shouldn't have been 367 yeah, pages. That's what we, that's what we that found. Was. It was like a book or something. Yeah. It should yeah, have been, pages. yeah, it should have been about 10 pages. Why is that because of the references? It was like nine pages. Yeah, it should, should have been, that, that's, that's the right one. It was just called the American Revolution. It was named at the McGill University. Oh. I found it on my psych info. There you go. I'll try to, I'll try to find that and post it on the Blackboard site. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the point is, again, the point of a lot of this is to think about not just the behavioral issues, but how those connect back to some biological issue, right? And I think that's what's fascinating about these things. Like, on some surface gut level, anybody can understand that if we were to separate a mother and child of any species, you're probably going to create some distress, right? But what's that doing to their brains? How's that affecting their adult behavior, right? And it's not just like some memory of that event. There are actual structural changes that happen, right? There's a point of view written developmental and the high risk families. Mm -hmm. I was talking about that. It was talking about they were testing cortisol levels in kids. Yeah. Come from very stressful households where abuse or neglect. And their resting cortisol levels were higher than people who were not. Yeah. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, so we talk about that neuroendocrine right there. It's exactly what we're talking about. And so if your cortisol levels are, what well, cortisol, that's a stress hormone, right? So if your cortisol levels are higher, you're always going to be uh, anxious, right? That's part of your sympathetic nervous system, right? Uh, cortisol gets really stressed. You're always going to be on edge. You're always going to have these problems. On top of that, your brain's going to die. Cortisol, ha I <laughs> Jason's face is, 
Uh, cortisol will actually, uh, and other glucocorticoids, will actually kill brain cells in your hippocampus specifically. And so it'll affect your, uh, your ability to retain memories and to create, consolidate long-term memories. So that's fascinating, right? If somebody offers you uh, water or sugary water, um, you'll typically choose sugary water, right? You actually have to try to not choose sugary water, right? That's, that's an effort. It takes some willpower, and rats don't have that. So rats will typically, if you give them water and sucrose water, they'll just drink the sucrose water preferentially, unless you, like, disrupt them a little bit, and then they won't. Again, you can give them, you know, antidepressants and see what happens. This is sort of interesting. We should talk about self-administration. Um, so now we're putting the power in the rat. So no longer are we just like grabbing the rat and giving it ecstasy. We'll let it squirt ecstasy in its brain whenever it wants, right? Uh, and so this is, they'll do this with cocaine a lot too. So you'll have a pump, you'll connect that to the rat somehow. Sometimes they'll connect it directly to the brain, sometimes it's systemic, it doesn't really matter. They press a lever, every time they press a lever, they get a little shot of drug, right? That's kind of interesting. Uh, what's not too surprising here is if you, let's say this is cocaine, uh, guess what the rat will do? Yeah, it'll keep, it'll keep pressing the lever, right, Kyle? Just right on it, every time. Now, if you uh, shut off the cocaine, what's interesting is it'll stop pressing the lever. It'll keep pressing for a while, and then it'll stop, right? Because it's like, well, I'm not getting any cocaine. Uh, but then all of a sudden, if you like just randomly give it a squirt of cocaine, it'll jump back over and start pressing the lever again. Because it thinks, like, ah, oh, I can get some now. Uh, these are drugs that are reinforcers in uh, rhesus monkeys. So there are all kinds of different monkeys that are sometimes used in research, rhesus monkeys being one of the main ones. Uh, they're kind of they're kind of big. I mean, they're... Like some of those rhesus macaques can be like the size of a three-year-old, and they have teeth, and they throw feces. But that's about the same. Um, <laughs> they just carry diseases that in their feces, so you got to watch that. And they're smart, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to like, you got to really like wrangle them around, because you don't want them getting out. Like a rat, you can just reach in and grab it, right? You can't just like reach in and grab a monkey. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Those marijuana and like classic psychedelics aren't on this list. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason why they're not on that list because they're, they're not really reinforcing. Um, most people like so LSD, for example, not on this list. Um, most people who stop taking LSD, they did it for one of two reasons. They either had a bad trip and they were like, "Well, I'm probably not going to do that again," or or they got bored with it. Like seriously, they'll just go like, eh, I'm gonna try something else now. Uh, that doesn't really work with cocaine. There aren't people who are like, man, that cocaine, it's getting a little boring, I'm gonna stop. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Because it activates, all of these guys will actually activate your dopamine system, your dopaminergic system is the uh, reinforcing reward system. Your psychedelics don't activate that system. Um, marijuana doesn't really activate that system either, right? So because they don't activate that system, then they're not going to have that sort of addiction potential. Right. So how, what argument do people make when they say that marijuana is like a gateway drug? Yeah, I, I, I think it's the same argument they make when they say, like, um, I'm going to try to think of a good, like, similar argument to that, right? But I can't because it's not a good one. It's like, it's like the, the argument is it normalizes. Yeah, but you could make like the same behavior like, well, nicotine is a gateway drug, caffeine's a gateway drug, right? What about Flintstones vitamins? That's a gateway drug. Yeah, I, I mean, it's like normalizing pill-taking behavior, right? I mean, I mean, if you really wanted to like, like, man, stop chewing on those Barney Rubbles, because uh, <laughs> you're going to become a, you know, pill head when you get older. I mean, I, I, I don't know, right? I mean, I, mean I, 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 I don't think there's any evidence as far as I know to really support that at all. Uh, I, I think, like most things, it's, 
um, an emotional argument that people are making, and that that really is a real problem. Um, and I think that's something I, I want to like beat out of you, if it's not already beaten out of you, right, Corey? And especially when you're going into it, because it's like different if you're making emotional arguments and you're like an interior decorator, right? And you're like. Like, you're just like, oh, I don't like floral patterns. People who use floral patterns are, that's just a gateway to plaids. I don't know, right? I mean, like, who cares, <laughs> right? I mean, it just, it just doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, I mean, and it doesn't matter. I don't care how you decorate the inside. Right? There's not really any impact on that, right? But when you start making emotional decisions and you're dealing with, like, people's lives and the quality of their lives, that, Cassie's like a big problem, right? And you're just like, man, you know, like, Geez, those people who wear shoes, we shouldn't let them into my store for whatever. I mean, it's just, oh, that's stupid, right? I mean, like, is there any evidence that people who wear shoes are worse than people that don't? I don't know, right? So what's the matter? It's just a stupid argument, right? Uh, and there's no evidence behind it. Now, if you do some evidence and it's like, you know, people who wear shoes are more likely to bring in dog turds, I don't know, uh, <laughs> then maybe you make that rule. But I mean, otherwise, you don't. And, and I just don't think there's any evidence there. It's something that's, it's, it's, an, it's an eye test, right? And something just... Just for some reason, it doesn't look right, and for some reason, but there's no, there's no real evidence to back it up. Yeah, I, th I think it's just people do that, and they, and they make these emotional sort of reactions, and then you confabulate. Do we talk about confabulation in this class? So this is something amazing you guys should know about. Uh, you've got a big thing. We talked about the corpus callosum, right? We talk about that. Yeah. So if you cut that corpus callosum, remember the banana story? That's confabulation, right? And so people do this all the time, and they're like. You know, somebody says, oh, you, you shouldn't smoke marijuana. And then you'll just, like, make up all these reasons why you shouldn't smoke marijuana, right? Um, and maybe there are some reasons why you shouldn't. I don't know, right? I mean, that's for you to decide on an individual basis. Um, it's, it's probably not for me to tell you. It's for me to tell you if you're 12. I think that's probably a bad idea. But, you know, if you're, like, 22, it's like, well, you know, I think that's on you at that point. But I think, particularly for you folks, you're, you're in a field that is very emotional, right? And you're going to be tempted to make these sort of emotional reactions to your clients. And I think what's, what's really important is not to be pulled into that and to really go like, hey, I got to look at the evidence and see what the data tells me and follow that, right? You can't just go in there and like, you know, fall for these like sob stories and you can get yourself into like a pretty deep trap, right? I'm not saying don't care about people. That's my job. Um, you, you know, you guys obviously do care about people. But at the same time, if every person who comes in, you become too invested in them, I'm sure they tell you this, right? Like if you become too invested in them, then you're going to burn out and you're just going to, you've just wasted all, you, you've wasted your trough, right? You're going to have to go through another trough uh, at that point because you've got to get another career. And two, you're, you're going to, you know, you're going to entangle yourself in some way that's inappropriate, right? So you really have to try to, this is me trying to check off that professional relationship <laughs> competency. Uh, so you really got to try to try to do that. So I think this is a great class when you can start really thinking about hard scientific evidence and data, right? And you can start to really try to try to pull yourself and harden your outer shells a little bit to these emotional gut reactions. And you have these all the time. You don't even realize it, right? I mean, how many of you are? Um, I asked my class this yesterday. How many of you are Tom Brady fans? If you raise your, I'm not even going to look over there because I'm like looking at you guys. If they raise their hands, I'm going to fail them. Did any hands go up? Great. Because that guy's an idiot. Uh, and, like, no, he, he really is an idiot. I'm just telling you, he's really an idiot. Uh, and Because you know his, like, air quote doctor guy, Alex, whatever his name is, Guerrero, I think is it. Is that right? Anybody know this story? You know a few years. Huh? His trainer. His, yes. Which is even, I'm going to put air quotes on trainer. Because I don't even think that's a good, I don't even think he's got the credentials to be a trainer. So, you know, Corey, a few years ago, they had that, it was called NeuroSafe. Uh, it was this juice they sold you that would help protect you from getting a concussion. <laughs> you can find it on the internet. There's a whole story about it. Uh, they called it a seatbelt for your brain. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> he sells all kinds of stuff, right? I really so my understanding of Alex Jones is all filtered through uh, Stephen Colbert. So so I'm just gonna tell you like like that, that. So when I say something about Alex Jones, that's that's 
the the amount of his show I've seen. <laughs> Although I, I heard him and Marco Rubio had a big throwdown recently today, right? Did anybody hear about that? Like, like they bumped into each other in the hall or something, and like Alex Jones touched him, and Rubio was apparently like, "Get your hands off me, man!" or something. I don't know. <laughs> that was kind of he's kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, not that I blame Marco Rubio or Alex Jones, whichever one said it. Uh, either way, I probably would have said the same thing. Either of those guys tried to touch me. Um, yeah, so that, anyway, uh, they, they tried selling that. But it was like, you know, so I think about like sports, right? Like some of you are fans of a particular sports team. Why? Got no reason, right? Kyle, are you, what's your favorite team? You have a favorite which, sport? Which sport? Any sport. What's your favorite sport? Uh, Fly fishing? God's not I'm, a sport. I'm a Bengals fan, but it's kind of like That's a shame. problem. <laughs> it's just that it's, it's all, there's always shame here. Yeah. At least they're not Cleveland. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> nope, somebody's a Cleveland fan. Well, just like, Are you from Cleveland? No. Like, I'm from Northern Ohio. That's fine. So you kind of you, you have to be. You're, you're, you're stuck. That's where you like it's spread. So you guys are okay then. I feel better about you because, like, if you were... Like, uh, I mean, I know they suck. Like, that's the I'm a Reds fan too. But, but they're, they're your home team, right? So you yeah. got to root for them. Like, that's that's fine. That's okay. We'll let you buy. But there are these people who are like fans of teams and they have no reason and they're just like, well, that you know, and they'll make up all these. Or like, you like a particular person for some reason, you start making up reasons why. Right? You have this emotional reaction to things. You guys got to watch that. And I, <laughs> and I, no, seriously, because I think when it comes to like drugs and drug use, People have emotional reactions to things, and then they try to backfill the evidence. And I really think that's what's going on with the gateway drug argument. Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I mean, people just have these. Like I said, they have these gut reactions for one reason or another. They heard somebody say it, then they're just going to run with it, and then we'll we'll make up what can happen behind it, right? And that may or may not be accurate. So there you go. Hey, so uh, great job pointing out drugs that weren't on this list. Uh, did you point out the interesting drug that is on this list is caffeine? More addictive than marijuana. <laughs> so, so that, I mean, if, so if you're really worried about like someone becoming addicted to something, we should probably start regulating coffee. I don't know. Starbucks people, right? I mean, that's the folks we need to shut down, not those marijuana dispensaries, right? Or that guy who lives up the holler from you, right? Whatever his name was, which you're not allowed to tell. That'd be interesting. I thought about that actually on my drive-in today. Like, if we took away all of the caffeine, like, what would happen? They'd all die. Or you'd be fine. I know. You'd I don't know. Be okay, but like, what would other people do? Like, people who have like six yeah. cups of coffee. Then hey, yeah. Destiny, you know who else would be fine? Those people out in Utah, the Mormons. That's right. Because <laughs> they don't ingest caffeine. Mm -hmm. Tom Hall would be too shy. Yeah, that's right. He would be what? Too chipper. Tom Hall? No. He doesn't caffeine. Really? No. Eh, whatever. I mean, people have been using caffeine and other stimulants for a long time. I don't think it's anything to worry about. You know. Like start twitching. <laughs> Everybody would be so cranky because they don't have a bad headache. Or they just go to sleep. I think a lot, yeah, I think people would just sleep. More naps. But anyway, I think it's interesting caffeine's on this list. And later we might actually talk about schedules of drugs, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about and how they schedule drugs and what drugs are, like, higher schedules than other drugs and what ones might be more harmful. It's really interesting. So there you go. Hey, breaking point. This is an interesting concept. Cocaine has a very high breaking point. What does that mean? Uh, cocaine will give you a lot of kapow, right? If you take it. Uh, so you're willing to put a lot of effort into getting it. Caffeine, on the other hand, will not give you as much, so you're not willing to just put as much effort into it, right? So if you were using self-administration of caffeine here, that rat's gonna give up a lot faster. Once you cut off the caffeine, it's gonna go, eh. But if it's cocaine, it'll keep going for a lot longer, right? Because cocaine has a higher uh, reward value. It's kind of interesting. Um, hey, who loves to electrocute themselves? 
Rats will do this. I assume people will do it too. Uh, if you could stimulate certain brain regions, right? Just like a little weak electrical current. Just enough to send a little dopamine out, right? That'd be pretty awesome. How many of you would do that? Yeah, like everybody, Kyle, just be honest, right? <laughs> if you had a little like thing in your brain and you had a little button that would release some dopamine every time you pushed it, you'd push it all day long, right? I mean, I mean, most people would because it'd make you feel good. It's not a big deal. This is another way you can look at it, like addiction potential, condition place preference. So you can measure how much time an animal spends in a certain area, uh, and if that area is associated with a drug, you know, they'll spend more time there. Not a big deal. Discrimination testing. If you want to think about translational research, that's a fancy term that somebody made up a long time, like not that long ago really, but a while back to, uh, I think, make their research sound like more important. I think what happened is there's like, there's like basic science research, and then we think about like clinical research, and then there's like some stuff in between, and that's translational research, right? So stuff that actually has some application to clinical use. Um, again, all drugs have to be approved by the FDA. They've got a pretty low pass rate, right? So maybe like 20% of new drugs actually make it to market. Um, so they, 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 uh, they eliminate a lot. A lot of drugs just prove to be ineffective once they go to clinical trials. A lot of them have a really high side effect profile, or they don't seem to be any better than what's already on the market. Right? And that's about how long it can take, right? So it can take, um, you look at this, we're looking at you know, 10, 15 years to try, once a, once a drug has been developed and started using it in, uh, in research, until it can actually reach it out to the market. Um, you know, for, for your average average user. There's sort of two arguments here. There's one that this is like a very slow process, right? And it takes a long time to get a new drug to market, something that could be helpful to certain individuals, right? The other argument is we don't want to just like dump any random drug out onto the market and some guy just slaps a label on it and says, hey, this works. Um, yeah. <laughs> We've never heard that. No. Um, although, interestingly, there's a new um, opioid some folks have just developed that they actually claim doesn't have an addiction profile. Now, it's still in this like preclinical animal testing phase. This is not, so here's a big distinction. This is not the pharmaceutical rep marketing team saying it's not addictive. This is the biochemist saying it's not addictive, right? And so that's a little bit different. So keep your eyes out for that. They've actually changed it so it doesn't, um, it doesn't stimulate all of the opioid receptor subtypes. So it does relieve pain, but it doesn't seem to activate that reinforcement, that reward system. All right, you don't need to know too much about like phase two drugs, um, genetic differences, brain lesions, we can talk about this stuff. This is what's kind of troubling sometimes. So to recreate some of these disorders in animals, we have to do things that are different. And we're really what we're just, sometimes we're doing is we're just creating the symptoms and maybe not recreating the, um, the cause. And then when we give something that might treat the cause, uh, that may or may not work. Like, how many of you have ever coughed? <laughs> yeah, and, and why was that? Uh, well, there are like 15 different reasons why you might cough. And so if I want to study coughing and I want to prevent you from coughing, uh, okay, I can do that, right? And so I'm going to make this animal cough. I'm going to do it by like pumping a bunch of dust into its cage. Make it cough. That seems like a good idea. But you might have been coughing because of a bacterial infection. So I create this drug that keeps it from coughing because of dust. I give it to you and you still cough. Because I didn't really solve the problem, right? I, I, I treated a symptom. And a symptom that was caused by a different issue. It's just something to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. 
stop signal test, it's got impulsivity. Don't need to worry too much about this. There is, um, if we want to stick things in the brain, we use what's called a stereotaxic apparatus. That's kind of interesting. This is one for a rat. It's got this 3D coordinate system so you can find exactly where you want to go in the brain. You want to go hippocampus, pal, you're there. So it kind of looks like that. Here's one for the human. That doesn't look painful at all. <laughs> and then you go, oh, right, here's where I want to go. Drill a hole, let's get in there. Anybody had a hole drilled in their head before? Nobody has to answer that. I've got video of my uncle having a cerebral bypass. It's pretty cool. Nobody found that interesting, but <laughs> yeah, they cut open like they removed part of his skull and then had to like take the the blood vessel. And Why do you have the video? <laughs> the doctor videoed it, and then you it. they like asked if anybody wanted it, and I was like, sure. <laughs> You're not going to get your hands on that kind of stuff every day. Why did they have to have a cerebral bypass? He had a, like a calcium deposit or something in his brain. So, long story, the guy eats like hot dogs all the time. <laughs> and so he had to go in to have like cardiac bypass surgery. The problem is, <laughs> so like you see how this is connected, right? So the problem is, though, he never took his blood pressure medication. And so his blood pressure was always kind of high, which was great because he had that blockage in his, his blood vessel in his brain. So the high blood pressure just continued to like pssst, squirt blood past it, right? And so he was okay. When he's in the hospital, one, he's on painkillers because they just like saw it open his chest. And two, they actually give him the medication his doctor told him to take. Well, the problem is that dropped his blood pressure so low that it, his brain stopped getting all the blood supply and he had a basal ganglia stroke, which is sort of interesting. Uh, because he can't do math now. Uh, no, he really has serious trouble with math. Uh, he still does other things like drives, which is a little frightening. Uh, does he do math if he drives? <laughs> yeah, he can do math while you drive. You're not like counting the cars and dividing them by anything. No, but I feel like it takes some logic, and math is logic. Yeah, he just, uh, so it's my mom's brother, so they like still, you know, see each other. And so when they, when they go out to eat, like she has to calculate the tip for him because he can't figure out how much to give, which I think is kind of funny. <laughs> so anyway, he accidentally had a stroke because he went in for a bypass surgery. I mean, nobody intentionally has a stroke, I yeah, guess. That's yeah. So he got a two for one there. <laughs> Just went in for a heart surgery. This was like a few years ago. He's still alive. I mean, I mean he's fine. Still plays golf. He can't, that, he can't, doesn't know a score. <laughs> and he, he still plays. I'm just like, yep, I think you had a seven on that one. <laughs> That's a true story. Why is that sad? He's happy. He's alive. Maybe it would be nice to not have to I don't think he's faking. <laughs> I mean, you sit and you talk to him, and he, he must be pretty good if he's faking it. What else is wrong with him? Before or after the stroke? Both. <laughs> that's, a, that's a separate set of questions. Wow. Uh, he's a lot funnier now. Oh. I don't think he means to be. <laughs> well, and he, he, he doesn't necessarily have, like, I don't know. He went on vacation a couple of years ago and started sending his grandson pictures of people's butt cracks when their pants were down too far, um, which is a little weird and creepy, but again, we're talking about a guy with brain damage, so I don't know what you do with that. So, his inhibitions, or? Yeah, he doesn't have those anymore. Yeah, I don't think that's, that's involved. I don't think there's anybody saying that's a bad idea. It's just, uh, whatever. He still drives. <laughs> yeah, he's still on the drive. The lack of inhibitions and the counting. The counting. It doesn't. I mean, what's he got to count? Like, count. how many people get in the car? Yeah, I mean, I just feel like you should know how many you could drive. I don't know. Yeah. Distance isn't. I mean, that's just like. 
an automatic calculation. <laughs> uh, neurotoxins, we can kill your brain with that. Intentionally sometimes, right? Uh, I'm not going to get you too much on this. Well, that's something. Uh, this is... This is like collecting brain fluid, right? So you're collecting like uh, extracellular fluid from their brains. This is important sometimes because um, you might want to measure, uh, you know, how effectively a drug gets into the brain. You might want to measure any byproducts that are made from a particular drug. So you could do that with this. You can pump stuff in there too. Don't worry too much about that. Ooh, voltammetry is fun. So this is when you can um, you can actually in real time measure neurotransmitter release, and you can sort of do this with that microdialysis technique. So if the whole point of giving you uh, an SSRI is to make more serotonin available, what I should do is actually see if there's more serotonin available, right? And how would I do that? Well, you would do it with either cyclic voltammetry or microdialysis, cyclic voltammetry is sort of real time, it happens right now. So you can actually, there's like a change in the current flow, and there's going to be a stereotypical change for every neurotransmitter, right? And you can uh, determine this with, um, you know, with whatever neurotransmitter is being released, and you can see that sort of change in current real time to see if there's an increase or a decrease in neurotransmitter release, which is actually pretty awesome. I should make you read a paper that did this. Sounds good, right? I should make you read a chapter that cites a paper that did this. Like chapter 10 about alcohol. It's a good chapter. Actually, I, I wrote part of the paper that they have in there, Jason. That's why it's such a good chapter. I didn't do the cyclic voltammetry. Somebody else did. But we made these rats drink alcohol. That was fun. So after I, st after I stopped giving rats ecstasy, I started giving them alcohol. Because uh, I thought, well, you know, try something else. Uh, and, th and then we, uh, we, we shot a laser into their brain, which was exciting. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about it at some point. And we could like control brain activity in the ventral tegmental area. And based on the way we did that, they would either stop drinking or, or continue to drink. It was actually pretty impressive, yeah. So, uh, for those of you interested in long-term potentiation, if you like, if we did like really like fast stimulation, uh, they would keep drinking. But if we did it slower, and we kind of, I, I think it was disrupting with that long-term potentiation and that kind of reward mechanism, they would actually stop drinking. Now, other folks have done it with electrical shocks, but they always had this like aversive reaction. When we did it with just opening and closing ion channels, they were just like, "Ah, we're done." They just like turned away from the alcohol. It was pretty impressive. So you could do that with humans, I guess. Yeah, I I, I, th I think I could even take off the hypothetical part. I, I don't see why it wouldn't work with the person. But I it's mean, never been done. Yeah, because they, they nobody's letting me cut open heads of humans. That's the holdup. Now they are trying the, these techniques in in monkeys, like it's called optogenetics. So, uh, which is actually pretty cool. Like, did we talk about optogenetics in here? We should, because this is this came out maybe ten or twelve years ago, uh, by this guy I call Big Carl. Um, his name's Carl Deserat, and then uh, his buddy Ed Boyden. Um, I think Big Carl's a little. That, that's that's sort of a. I don't know. He, he's a little. He sort of ripped a bunch of credit from Ed Boyden. Ed Boyden was. It was like a fifty-fifty thing, and then Ed Boyden was like this younger guy, but Carl was like, "No, we're gonna do it this way, and we're not gonna give this other guy credit in the lab we were working in." So it's like this kind of controversy about it, right? And. Carl Deeseroth was the main guy who caused the controversy. Ed Boyden wasn't. Ed Boyden does some other cool stuff, too. He's a nice guy. Um, I met Ed Boyden. That's how I know he's a nice guy. It's, I'm not just making this up. It's like true story. It is, right? So they're, they're just like everybody else. They're just like poking people in the brain. Um, and it's so, similar. so anyway, you can take, they, they like extracted this DNA from bacteria that's light sensitive. And they kind of like, you know, wove it into this uh, ion channel. Remember the ion channels we talked about? This ion channel DNA. And then they crammed it into a virus. 
and then they crammed that virus into a rat. And that virus gets into the rat brain and it does what any other virus does. It gets into a cell and then it tricks that cell into making whatever DNA is inside of that, right? So now, Jason, it's making the DNA of that light-gated ion channel. Remember when we talked about like most of them are uh, ligand-gated? This was light-gated, right? So it's fascinating. So then it gets, these ion channels get injected into the pre or the, you know, the, the postsynaptic membrane, right? So they're in there. And what you can do then you have to stick a fiber optic cable into the rat's brain, like a small one, and you got to shoot a laser through that, or an LED. The LEDs are powerful enough now to do that. And you shoot a little bit of, uh, you just pulse a light in there of whatever wavelength, and you can make it red, green, blue, whatever you want, because again, you're in control of the DNA. Uh, that'll open or close ion channels, whether they're sodium or chloride channels, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's whatever you want to do. So then you can just like pulse lasers into the brain of this animal, and it will open or close those ion channels at whatever speed you've said to. And you can control brain activity that way. It's pretty fascinating, right? See, that was a, that was a cool story. I think those guys are probably gonna get a Nobel Prize soon. Because I, I, I feel like as soon as that, as soon as we get that moved into the human population, what that opens up for us to treat um, neurological disorders is, is unbelievable. I mean, right now we're doing like electrical stimulation. You guys have heard of like deep brain stimulation and things like that. But there are a lot of, that's not specific. There are a lot of side effects. Um, when you inject electrical current, you're basically injecting that everywhere, right? Or in that small area. All of those cells are going to be activated. You may have only wanted to activate a subset of those cells that make a particular protein. You can do that with this optogenetics because you can specifically target that subset of cells, even in that small area. It's fascinating. It's cool, right? Provided you're not having cognitive decline because your cells are dying. I mean, if your cells are dying, there's not much you're going to be able to do about that. But, um, but if it's just because of, you know, the ones you have aren't functioning as well, you could potentially do all kinds of things. Is it not creating new cells then? No, it's just ion channels within the cells that exist. Oh. Yeah. It's pretty cool, right? See how fascinating that was? <laughs> yeah, so basically, you, let's say you've got a guy who's addicted to heroin and everything you've tried, he won't stop. Um, you could just inject. Uh, you know, these ion channels into the, there's the circuit, the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens is the main sort of addiction reward pathway. Uh, you could put those ion channels in there, drill a hole, put a little fiber optic down in there, flash a light every now and then uh, when he was going to, you know, maybe take an opioid or something and eliminate the reward that he gets from taking the drug and then he'll stop. That's pretty cool, right? We're going to put you guys out of business. <laughs> I think you got a decade or so. <laughs> I mean... It should be a little bit long term with the light flashing. That's, yeah. That's, that's what I'm wondering. Just, you just, just put it in there and then seal over. You just something. got a little battery pack. I mean... Okay. It's just like a pacemaker for, for your head. It's exactly what it is. There's a slogan. <laughs> you thought a seatbelt for your brain was good. <laughs> Pacemaker for your head, yeah. Well, then when you said a battery pack, that's what I thought of. Yeah, you have to have a small battery pack to run it. You guys read that book, Terminal Man, by Michael Crichton? Who's read that one? No. Who's telling me If you stop watching Parks and Rec, you probably read it. <laughs> <laughs> probably read a book or two. <laughs> See, I remember all of that. Uh, micro, ma macro electrodes, that's just like a big electrode, you can stimulate a lot of things at once. Uh, don't worry about that too much. Hey, uh, dental cement, that's fun. Um, you'll use that to make these head caps. Uh, it's great because it's biologically inert, so it's not going to grow bacteria and stuff. So if you remove part of the scalp, you know, the scalp will grow back around to it uh, and heal up and then you just have this little like cap sticking up. 
I think if you had one of those, like, you know, pacemakers for your head, you might want to wear a hat yeah. to cover it. But then it might be, like, the thing to have. I was thinking the other day about, um, about this very thing, and I was thinking of, did I tell you guys about my, uh, my rave hat? This is brilliant. So I was thinking, like, you know, ecstasy, that's something, right? But what if instead of like making you like giving you ecstasy because as we've said that's probably got some negative side effects, but what if I could just make you like have the same reaction to you taking ecstasy, right? By stimulating parts of your brain in that sort of pattern, right? Of activity. So that'd be cool. But then I thought it's because I'd be like shining lasers in there, but I thought, I mean I already got the lasers, I should shine them out too. So then you like, you know, you've got your own laser light show <laughs> inside and out. I thought that was brilliant. I imagined it like this colander that you were going to wear with like holes in it and you said the LEDs shooting out. I think it would be a big seller. No? I think it would. You could just, like, you know, you, you could just like, it's like plug it in, right? And then you just like pull it off and then you like wear like your normal hat. It would be like an add-on to that pacemaker for your head. It's like a special accessory. Uh, electrodes, pulse generators, don't worry about that. That guy looks really happy. <laughs> this really is a pacemaker for your brain, but the, the difference is this is actually an electrode, again, causing electrical stimulation. This is not uh, like that specific targeted laser for a specific subunit of cells that only have this light-gated ion channel, right? It's the specificity that's different. But we already have these little battery packs that go in and they do deep brain stimulation. Um, sometimes they'll do this for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, right? If things get so advanced, they'll actually start to electrically stimulate brain regions to help alleviate some of the symptoms. Intracellular, extracellular, um, that's not too big of a deal. You're just gonna stick electrodes into, I think that's a goofy drawing of a monkey, but all the same. This is kind of how it works. You put electrodes in the monkey's brain, the monkey does stuff, you record what's going on in those brain regions so you get some kind of electrical output. See if there's an increase or decrease in activity. Oh geez, if I were to try to talk to you about patch cramp, you guys would get lost. Um, essentially what you're doing is you're taking like a glass pipette and sticking it into a slice of brain and trying to like vacuum suck it onto the outside of a cell to like break the cell membrane to the inside of the pipette so then you've created a continuous like body with the cell and that pipette and there's like an electrode in there and then you can like record what's going on on the inside with the current changes see what did I tell you you're gonna get lost I'm just like Lisa Turan thinks this shit huh? Lisa Turan thinks of this shit yeah, so one of my friends, he didn't develop this technique, but he built, he worked, for, he actually worked for a pharmaceutical company for a while before it went out of business. Um, it wasn't his fault it went out of business. <laughs> they actually, um, they, they actually created an antidepressant and then they had like two failed clinical trials. And so they're one of these like small companies, they do research and, and development, right? So they'll like develop a drug and then they'll like sell that off to Merck or I, whatever, right? Uh, so they're, they're genius like board of directors decided uh, after that second failed clinical trial and their like stock dropped to save money they would cut their research and development division. <laughs> Which at that yeah, nothing. That that was the at that point they, they had kind of decided we're done and we're getting out. So Megan, that was the end of the story. And he lost his job. Okay. Um, <laughs> but he got another job uh, in St. Louis working for uh, like Millipur. I don't know if you guys may or may not know Millipore. They they're like a scientific they make stuff like this all the time. Anyway, he made one of these patch clamp devices that would like patch on to like 15 different slices of brain at a time. And it was all automated. So they can do this like high throughput kind of stuff where they're like recording. Because you don't want to, like recording from one cell at a time, that takes forever, right? But if you can record like 15 cells at once, well, that's 15 times as awesome. Don't worry about that. Radio ligand binding. Uh oh, is that the end of this? What happened? 
think it froze. Yeah, that was a winner. Uh, we'll just give this a moment. Give it a minute longer. See what <laughs> Somebody put some water in the computer. That's stuff you guys need to worry about. You guys don't think about that stuff, right? Did we have the we had the epigenetics conversation in this class, right? Yes. Yeah. Oops, I think that was the power button. Makes me concerned for you. Four sinks. I mean, I mean, that's just like, that's like a couple bathrooms in a kitchen. I mean, that's just not even like four yeah. sinks. Like, how many sinks do you have? Like a double vanity. Yeah, there you, yeah go. you get a double. Half bath in the kitchen. Yeah, and a double vanity. Yeah. Yeah. I have two sinks, though, right? Some of us Sinks. I'm gonna have to go home and add a sink. <laughs> only one faucet. I think it's faucets. I think you got to count faucets. That's that's my feeling on this. I mean, whatever you guys decide, I mean, it's kind of up to you. But I think faucets because you that that really is going to artificially inflate the number of seats that you have. Okay, we're back after our home improvement plumbing. And we've got 20 minutes to go. How many slides? I don't know how many slides either. Like 80 slides. Uh, radio <laughs> ligand blind, binding, you guys. Again. No. What is going on here? All right, we'll just do it this way. That laser pointer thing's giving problems. Um, specificity, saturability. Basically, this is a lot of stuff. Don't worry too much about it, because you're not going to do much with radio ligand binding. If you're interested, read about it in the book, but I'm not going to ask you a whole lot about it. Basically, it'll just show you which receptors are activated in the brain, where they're located, right? So you can see, like, if you really wanted to affect something that's, like in the amygdala, for example, if you wanted to kind of shut that down or activate that, then you, you could figure out what you're doing. Other receptor binding antibodies... This is a way that we will visualize cell cells, immunocytochemistry. We'll use antibodies uh, to add some uh, contrast so we can see the shapes of cells. These are cell bodies actually uh, here. So that's the soma. And sort of coming off here, you can see the axons are those bigger things. These little guys, see those little like dotted squiggly lines? Those are actually like beaded axons like terminals from another another set of cells. So that's kind of cool, right? Don't worry too much about this radio assay stuff. ELISA, in situ hybridization, you're not going to some DNA stuff. I'm not going to really expect you to know. Some of the other stuff, I, this is actually kind of interesting. These genome-wide association studies, you might see some things on that because a number of the um, 
uh, disorders that you're going to see in your clients, they might be ones that are, you know, genetically linked, right? So you might hear something about your genome-wide uh, association studies or SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, right, SNPs. These are just small changes in uh, genes, right? So they only, they only differ just a little bit. You know, they might say, well, somebody who has this particular allele or that SNP or, or this, they're more likely or less likely to develop schizophrenia or something, right? So you may see some things like that. So just to give you a little background there so you know what those words are and you're able to, to understand what somebody's talking about. Yeah, they're looking at, do you have one, two, or zero copies of these alleles that are more or less likely to give you a particular disorder? Now, again, it's not a, the only time it's a guarantee is Huntington's disease. Um, if you have one copy of Huntington's disease, you're going to get it when you're 50 or 40, 40 to 50. If you have two copies, you're probably going to get it when you're 35. So, there you go. There's, there's no way around that. Uh, Huntington's disease is really the only thing we have. That's one gene guaranteed you're going to get it if you have one copy. If you have two copies, you're just going to get it at a younger age. Uh, most of the other disorders are not that way. There are a few that are um, Tay-Sachs, for example, probably not something. I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess. You're not going to see a lot of people with Tay-Sachs in West Virginia uh, for a couple reasons. One, there's not a, a high Jewish population in West Virginia, so uh, typically only folks of Jewish descent um, carry Tay-Sachs and um, as more and more people are having genetic counseling before they have kids, you're reducing the likelihood that you're going to do that. So I was going to ask about Huntington's disease like, yeah. so that's like preventable like you could, yeah, you wouldn't just develop that. Like. No, no but the problem is like how many of you know how old your parents were when you were born? You don't have to share that information. Okay, okay well, well actually I, I think I should have you share it. Uh, if you don't mind, like like if it's something like embarrassing, like twelve, then you, you don't want to share that. I understand. Or like seventy-five, and you don't want to share that. I understand. I'm trying to like pick extremes here. Um, but most of your parents, I, I mean, my dad was like twenty-seven. I think my mom was like twenty-four. That's like a normal age, like mid twenties to early thirties, right? I think most most people's, not everybody, but most people's parents. Now, most of the time, you don't get uh, Huntington's disease until you're like forty or older, right? So you've already had kids at that point, and so you may not know. Uh, and especially if you didn't know your your grandparents, right? So if one of your grandparents has Huntington's disease, if anybody's in that group, you need to have some genetic testing before you have kids. The downside of that is you may have Huntington's disease as well, and you're not going to know it. <clears throat> so that can be a, you know, if you're like 25 and you're thinking like, man, I want to try to have kids, right? I mean, that maybe that's an age that people want to have kids. Um, and you think, well, I'm going to have, I'm going to get tested because, you know, because um, my grandmother had Huntington's disease or something. There's a chance you're going to figure out you have Huntington's disease and you might figure out one of your parents has it. Because there's no way for you to get it without your parents having it, right? I mean, that, that's how this works. Because one copy will give you Huntington's disease. And so where did you get that one copy? It had to come from one of your parents, right? So one of them is going to develop Huntington's disease as well. And if they have two copies, you're guaranteed to have it. If one of your parents has two copies of Huntington's disease, the, the Huntington gene, then you're definitely getting Huntington's disease because you can only get, you know, copy A or copy B, and they're both defective. That's not a real uplifting story, is it? But by getting tested before you have kids, you could stop the spread of Huntington's disease by just not having kids if you have it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you could also, like at a younger age, start thinking about preventative things, things you could do that could maybe prolong your life and, and, and help you out there. So, so there you go. It's not an all sad story. How do you prevent Huntington's? You don't. But, but you could do other things, like maybe you could have some diet and exercise, uh, you know, lifestyle choices so you're healthier uh, when the symptoms start, right? So you're better able to, to take that and adjust it. You can prepare yourself mentally for that and emotionally, right? So that party really hard and enjoy what life you have. That might be an option as well, right? And if there are things that you know you want to do, if you got a bucket list, start it at thirty. Don't don't start it at fifty. Uh, well, I, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, if right, it's going to happen. 
you're, you're not going to make it to 60 if you have Huntington's disease. So, I know it's like really uplifting, right? So there you go. Uh, but it's, it's not going to happen. And so you, you should prepare for that, and you should plan for that. And, and if, you were, if you're in a relationship with someone, that might be something they need to prepare for, right? You would have been a good great connection. <laughs> I think that was a joke. Uh, but you should, right? Because, I mean, you think about uh, what if you do have kids? What if you do have a spouse or, or someone else? Um, you've got to start thinking about, like, life insurance and life planning. And, uh, and these are important decisions that you guys probably aren't even thinking about. I think, like, two of you are. I think there are two of you who I think are mature enough to think about that. And the rest of you just aren't. <laughs> <laughs> Did you expect it to go a different direction? No. Okay. It's always an insult. You know what? In, so you should never get upset about an insult. It's either not true, or if it is, you should do something to fix it. Right? She might have been one I already had on the list. <laughs> it's never too early to think about life. Right now, actually, is the time to buy life insurance. Do you know why? You're not old, crotchety, and diseased. Yeah, so it's going to be cheaper. So if you wanted to get like a whole life policy or a universal policy, now's the time to really think about that. Uh, term policies are going to be pretty cheap for you as well. I don't know if we offer anything through Marshall for you guys. I don't know what your status is. I know I, they give me some optional life insurance. I think I pay like $12 a month for like $250,000 coverage or something through a term policy they have. So, and I have other policies as well. So None of you are beneficiaries, so don't kill me. Because <laughs> uh, you're not getting any money. Although I've, I've explicitly instructed my wife like, if I die crossing 20th Street between the stadium and the rec center, use the money to build a memorial pedway. Uh, <laughs> because that's a dangerous place to cross the street. Yeah. So SNPs, uh, we're going to use the word associated here because, um, again, except for Huntington's disease, it's just going to make you more likely. Right, because there's still going to be environmental issues and other things that can either, um, you know, prevent this or, or increase its likelihood. But these guys are kind of. A lot of people don't do these. I mean, they're, they're super easy. Just like, just run it. You know. Brain structure. I'm not going to get into like CFOS stuff with you guys. CT scans, I mean, that's like a fancy x-ray, right? It'll give you a 3D image if there are problems. Not going to give you a lot of real-time activity, but it'll give you, like, if there's a big gob of something that's not right. Right, and you can look like, oh, that guy's got a tumor. MRI is kind of the same, slightly different. Diffusion tensor imaging is actually kind of cool. You can actually see... Um, like uh, axons, right? So you can see connections between brain regions. So if you're looking for that, uh, that's kind of interesting. Folks who stutter, I don't know, you guys, you probably don't do much with like speech pathology, right? Um, folks who stutter, if they go through, what's really interesting is they, they go through like therapy and treatment and their, you know, their, their plans for this, they'll actually develop, um, actually like increase the axons, like the connections between their auditory in their auditory cortex, which is cool, so you can see that with, with uh, DTI, which is kind of fascinating. Don't worry about this stuff. So, like isotopes and things, I don't want to tell you about isotopes. You don't want to hear about isotopes. You didn't want to hear about ions. Um, fMRI. That's something. These other things aren't as common. fMRI is something you probably hear of. Right, that's actually going to give you some idea about like real-time brain activity. Again, it's it's not it's not perfect, right? Because there are some problems. It's actually going to look at like oxygenated hemoglobin, right? So it's going to look at your oxygen level and brain regions, and uh, obviously brain regions that are doing things probably need more oxygen. So you'll send more oxygen there. 
to supply what the brain is doing. So then it just lights up. Uh, again, you can you can give you know people can just hang out in the fMRI machine. You give drugs, whatever. EEGs. Probably some of you have had an EEG, right? I mean, they slap the electrodes on your brain. They'll get a little readout what's going on. Uh, that looks comfortable. <laughs> I always love these. I like the ones they put on babies. Now those are fun looking. They look like a shower cap with all these like electrodes coming out. Anybody ever seen one of those? Anybody have one at home? <laughs> Thought maybe you did. I don't know. Who knows what Jason has in his basement? <laughs> <laughs> one day, Jason, I'm going to have you sit over here by the window. Not the final exam. Because I, because if you do that, then you're not going to, right? Because he needs to sit over there for the final exam, because that's where he is mostly. But I'm going to have you come over here just briefly one day and sit, just to see how it feels, see if you like. <laughs> oh, ERPs are kind of interesting. They're kind of like EGs, um, a little different. They use ERPs sometimes with, uh, like, um, kids born with what's what they call. They don't call it neonatal abstinence syndrome now, right? They call it neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. That's the new fancy acronym now. Um, they'll, they'll have, in their visual cortex, they'll have some funky ERPs, which is kind of interesting. So there you go. Genetic engineering. Uh, we might talk a little bit about knockout mice or knock-in mice or just transgenic. Uh, folks have screwed around with their DNA to give them a particular set of characteristics, right? Whatever those are. And we don't need to go through all of them because there are, are a bunch of them out there. Uh, probably for just about anything. That's just a weird example with you know, coat color. You guys hear a lot about CRISPR these days, right? It's all over the news. We're going to start like screwing around with people's DNA and you guys see that movie Gattaca? <laughs> no, no, this had uh, Jude Law, Ethan Hawke, and Uma Thurman. Uh, it probably came out in 1998. Somebody could look that up and confirm that. Uh, but it was about like genetic engineering. Like one guy was born like before genetic engineering, but he had a brother who was born afterward. And it was kind of interesting. And then there was like a guy who was injured but was like selling his DNA to this other guy so that he could pass for something a little better than he was and he could get good jobs and stuff. It's kind of fascinating. Maybe we'll talk about like ethical dilemmas with like genetic engineering. Not the ones you think of like should we do it, but if everybody else is doing it, shouldn't you too? Does anybody buy that stuff, right? The CRISPR stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's out there. Have fun with it. But I think, like, what if you knew your kid was going to be born with a disorder, that, like a genetic disorder you could fix, but you didn't? Is that, like, neglect or abuse as a parent? Like, that's a cool question, right? I mean, I think it is. It's something for you to think about. Like, what if your parents kn knew you were going to have Down syndrome, and there was a way to fix that, but they didn't? You should never she accept. Not to give back to me. I didn't mean to, you know. Yeah, no, it, no, it's not kind of. It is. <laughs> uh, that's a rotor rod. That's kind of cool. I don't really need to talk about that. Optogenetics. Oh, there's optogenetics. So that whole conversation I had with you. Here are pictures. Uh, but it's like super awesome though. Pulses of light. Look, and it just like pow, shuts stuff down. It's really awesome lasers, viruses. I mean, if you're really, I mean, this is like the coolest thing ever. We're going to stick a laser and, a, and there it is. There's a rat with a uh, with a fiber optic in its brain. I think it's pretty awesome. I'm not going to talk about any of this stuff. Um, 
There's like magnets and stuff. I mean, it's some crazy stuff out there. Uh, any questions about that? Because I'm 